Well, it's being said that rioting broke out in Louisville over the grand jury's decision, the Breonna Taylor case, but that's wrong on two levels. For one, the chaos in Louisville, uh, as in so many other cities across the country, is funded and organized. Moments after the grand jury returned only three counts of wanton endangerment against one officer for firing shots that went into a neighbor's apartment, but no charges for Taylor's death, U-Hauls packed with pre-made signs and riot shields were already on the scene being unloaded. Now, it's clear that there's, there's orchestration and planning involved. Also, these are not mere riots. These are violent uprisings with the clear and often stated goal of destabilizing the government and burning down the system. In other words, it's insurrection. So rather than riots breaking out, this was another campaign of insurrection being carried out. And the distinction is important. It's also important, though not relevant to the insurrectionists, that the narrative surrounding the Breonna Taylor case, advanced by BLM and Antifa and their allies in the media, has proven to be almost entirely false. The narrative in these high-profile police shootings is always false, of course. The only question is one of degree, just how wrong will it turn out to be? In nearly all of the high-profile cases over the past few months especially, that answer has generally varied between extremely and incredibly. For example, the narrative around the Jacob Blake uh, shooting in Kenosha claimed that he was unarmed uh, and shot by cops while trying to get into his car after stopping to break up a fight. In reality, he was harassing his alleged rape victim, was armed with a knife, was reaching into his ex-girlfriend's car, which he was allegedly trying to steal when the officer fired. In the shooting of Dion K in D.C., we were, we were at first told that K was an unarmed child shot in the back. As it turns out, he was an adult, a known gang member, and was shot in the chest while running towards officers with his gun drawn. The case of Ricardo Munoz in Lancaster, activists told us that he was a, a mentally disabled person, randomly gunned down outside his mother's house. Some even said, uh, there were some BLM people online saying he was an autistic child murdered by the cops. In reality, Munoz was 27 years old, was shot because he chased after a police officer while wielding a large knife. BLM has gotten almost every fact of every case wrong. Going all the way back to Michael Brown in 2014, who was claimed to have been murdered with his hands up while begging for his life, forensic evidence eyewitness reports eventually confirmed that he was actually shot while assaulting a police officer and trying to steal his weapon. And this after he had assaulted a store clerk and uh, committed a robbery. So what about Breonna Taylor? Now, initially it was reported that police burst into the wrong apartment without knocking during a botched drug raid and murdered Taylor while she was asleep. That would be indefensible if it was true, but once again, it wasn't. As Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron uh, explained in his press conference on Wednesday, officers were serving a legal warrant at the right location, and they did knock before entering. An independent witness corroborates that they announced and identified themselves. Upon entering the residence, Brianna, Taylor, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, opened fire on officers. When police returned fire, Breonna Taylor was hit and killed. Here's uh, Cameron uh, at the press conference explaining some of this. Evidence shows that officers both knocked and announced their presence at the apartment. The officer's statements about their announcement are corroborated by an independent witness who was near in a proximity to apartment four. In other words, the warrant was not served as a no-knock warrant. When officers were unable to get anyone to answer or open the door to apartment four, the decision was made to breach the door. After breaching the door, Sergeant Mattingly was the first and only officer to enter the residence. Sergeant Mattingly identified two individuals standing beside one another at the end of the hall, a male and a female. In his statement, he says that the male was holding a gun, arms extended, in a shooting stance. Sergeant Mattingly saw the man's gun fire, heard a boom, and immediately knew he was shot as a result of feeling heat in his upper thigh. Kenneth Walker fired the shot that hit Sergeant Mattingly, and there's no evidence to support that Sergeant Mattingly was hit by friendly fire from other officers. Now, we should mention a warrant was issued for Taylor's apartment because there was reason to suspect that Taylor, or at least her apartment, was in some way involved in her criminal ex-boyfriend's drug, drug enterprise. 
Um, as court documents show, Taylor's car was spotted multiple times outside of a known drug house that was under surveillance by law enforcement. Taylor is on tape, reportedly, referring to the drug house while speaking to her then-boyfriend while he was in jail. In 2016, the body of a murder victim was allegedly found in a car rented by Taylor, which she said she had lent to her boyfriend. Um, shortly after her death, the ex-boyfriend was again recorded in jailhouse phone conversations claiming that Taylor was, quote, handling his money. The point is that the warrant was issued for entirely valid reasons. The cops executed it according to the law, following all the proper protocols, only opened fire after Walker had begun shooting at them. There is no basis for calling this a murder, much less a racist murder by agents of white supremacy. It's a tragic accident, a, a catastrophic confluence of events. Many other terms can be used to describe it, but the fact remains that officers were serving a lawful warrant, acting within the bounds of the law, and responding with lethal force to the lethal force being used against them. As usual, those accusing the officers of criminal conduct have not bothered to explain what they might have done differently. Should they have not obtained the warrant for the apartment in the first place, despite having credible reason to believe that it had ties to drug trafficking? Should they not have executed the warrant? Should they not have, uh, or should they have waited outside for someone to come to the door, and if the residents refused to answer, then just pack up and go home? Or should they have not returned fire once, once they were fired upon? Instead, you know, diving to the floor or hiding behind furniture, hoping the assailant stops before a bullet hits one of them in the face. Now, BLM militants, if they were being honest, would actually answer yes to all of those questions. They've made it clear that their problem with the police is that the police exist. Anything the police do, therefore, is wrong. For the simple fact, the police are the ones doing it. For BLM and its allies, the fight against police brutality is a fight against policing itself. All law enforcement is brutality in their minds. And anybody who dies at the hands of police, any black person anyway, has been murdered no matter what, regardless of context. This is the radicalism that holds our cities hostage, the madness to which we are all supposed to bow. It dresses itself in the garb of racial justice, it carries signs that say things like equality. But this is all a decidedly unconvincing disguise for their radical assault on law and order and civilization itself. And that's what's happening. And now it's happening in Louisville. Hope you enjoyed this segment of The Matt Wall Show uh, because you should know on September 28th, it will be moving from the Daily Wire channel to be available exclusively on my YouTube channel. You can go there, youtube.com slash Matt Walsh, and you can get the link in the description below as well. I'm also making a lot of new content that you can only find on my channel. So subscribe, ring the bell to make sure you never miss a new video.